Hello and welcome to Design Dispatches, where today I'm joined by Natsai Audrey Chiesa, who is a bio designer, who was born in uh, Zimbabwe, uh, trained in the UK, read architecture in Edinburgh, and then material futures at Central St. Martins before postgraduate research at UCL in London, uh, as well as being designer in residence there, and who set up, co-founded Faber Futures in 2018, who's had work shown in all manner of institutions, from the Pompidou to the Cooper Hewitt, and of course the Design Museum. Uh, Nat, so welcome. It's great to see you with that stunning backdrop. Um, I want to spool back to um, whether it was an, a moment or, or, or just a, a series of events that made you want to be a designer. How did that come about? Thank you so much, Tim, and um, for inviting me to join you today. I'm very excited to have this conversation. Um, what inspired me to want to become a designer? Well, I, I grew up in Zimbabwe. Um, and uh, I suppose I, I, I'm what you might call the born free generation, the generation that was born after our independence. Um, and there was an expectation, I think, that um, that generation of, of babies would become, um, you know, leaders in our communities across different professional spaces. And so there was almost this unsaid rule that um, you must pick a profession. Um, so I, I loved art and, um, Really, this is where my creativity flourished. Um, but I thought, okay, the way to get around this is to study architecture. So from a very early age, actually, um, I knew that architecture was the space where I could kind of indulge um, in this and, um, uh, and, and also make my parents proud and supportive. Um, so by the time I moved to Zimbabwe with my family in um, circa 20, Oh, two. I was 17 at the time. Uh, I finished school and I went to Edinburgh and I enrolled on the architecture course there. And um, I love the idea that architecture is the literal space and the metaphorical space that you wanted to inhabit. But I wonder how architecture then led into um, to, to, to material futures and biodesign. It seems very more you become more and more focused, or is that too reductive? Um, no, absolutely not. Um, so ar architecture was an incredible education, um, discipline, theory, and, um, you know, uh, thinking really about design in context was what I took away from that. Um, but I also found it incredibly restrictive. Um, culturally, that's when my culture shock happened on, on moving to the United Kingdom. Um, I couldn't square uh, the historical with um, my lived reality and as it was in Zimbabwe. So um, for, for lack of, I think, that sort of intellectual nourishment uh, from a curriculum that was um, very reductive, I started to look in other spaces um, for, for, um, for a little bit of spontaneity and otherness and fashion actually became that space. Uh, it was closer to um, the, the people. It was uh, open source. It was something that could be cut and paste. And I remember you know, going to the Royal Mile every Friday to see what new fashion magazines had come in. Um, and I was sort of totally amazed at what a, a new generation of fashion designers in London were up to. And I thought this is an, an amazing, if you like, scaling down of, of some of these big architectural questions um, that we've been exploring um, literally to the, to the body scale. How do we, um, how, how can I think about what I'm thinking but on that lens? And so I went to St. Martin's and enrolled on what was then called Textile Futures MA. Uh, it's now called Material Futures. And um, our instructors uh, were incredible, Carol Calais, um, we also had Caroline Till, Kate Goldsworthy, um, and they just opened up this world, not necessarily of fashion, because obviously it was textile futures, but how materiality is mediating scale, uh, either in, in architecture or in fashion. But what I sort of landed on there, um, this is a course that brings together craft, technology, uh, and asks you to ask the design question in that context. Um, I discovered that, you know, there's this new field of uh, science uh, called synthetic biology and that as a technological lens um, that was going to reshape material um, culture that was going to uh, change the relationship between the design of the material and, and uh, technology. And so I, I wanted to understand how these scientists um, were applying and engineers were applying engineering principles to biology to be able to design biology. Um, what was an organism designer? 
uh, what was the role of the designer in that new design space. Um, and so my practice kind of evolved um, to live very much within that territory. Again, making a shift after graduating from the theoretical into practice. Um, and that's when I became a designer in residence. I first design residency, um, but in a scientific lab at University College London. So working very closely with Professor John Ward, I started to develop a design practice that um, started to bring these two, these two worlds together, biology and design. Um, how do you design biology and how do you design the conditions for biology? And what are the uh, implications um, of that? Uh, and, and the way that we, that we were able to collaborate on such a sort of long and ongoing project was um, through the, 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 the organism. Um, Professor John Ward, I remember quite early on, um, saying, why don't you just concentrate on this particular microbe? Um, and he sort of let, let me get on with it. And it was this uh, pigment producing Streptomyces sedicolor, a soil microbe that is very well characterized in science. Um, it, uh, it is uh, an organism that scientists are working with for, and, um, for uh, research around um, antibi antibiotics. Um, but because it produced a, a pigment, I suppose he thought I would find that interesting. Um, and I immediately made the connection between pigment textiles. And, and that's where really the practice um, uh, around my biodesign um, was, was able to flourish. I like this idea of embodiment and the living space and the body generating fashion and fashion as the architecture of the body are reflecting that, but also biology and this kind of journey of living organisms creating fabrics and materials. Um, you, you paint the picture as if it's totally symbiotic. Is that right? Or, or does one side dominate? I mean, I read once that you, you said you see science or, and biology through the design lens, but that still makes it seem quite equal, really. Um, I think that uh, does one side dominate? It depends on the context. And I think that's what we're trying to figure out is how do we bring these worlds that never used to be apart together? Um, how do we bring uh, the artistic with the spiritual, with the scientific? Um, actually, a lot of indigenous cultures across the world will tell you how, but uh, that's not how we are building um, our educational frameworks uh, to equip uh, scientists or designers for that, for that matter to be able to merge um, knowledge systems together to, to come up with a better research question or research me methodology. And so the work that we are really um, concerned with is how we build these frameworks for, um, for communication that ideas have um, equal footing to be heard um, and, and that you can actually start to build the infrastructures to facilitate that. So for example, um, one of our um, longtime collaborators, uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, a Boston-based uh, biotech startup, you know, we have developed a residency program with them um, as, a, as a process, as a space and as a process to embed design um, in, in all of its uh, permutations um, as culture, as practice um, in, in this biotech startup. Um, and, and, and the reason why we, we thought it was necessary to do that was to demystify what design was. And especially for, um, you know, a company that has people call, you know, whose job title is organism designer. What, what is the full spectrum of design? How do we bring that in? How do we make some of those methodologies tangible? Um, how do we actually attribute value to them? Um, and it's an amazing program because you, over a three month period, um, a designer comes in from anywhere in the world um, and is able to develop a design led uh, project, working with the team from Ginkgo to be able to actually come up with real material responses to what that, you know, maybe hypothetical question um, might be. And so it's really important to think about um, how we can not just try to collaborate with scientists uh, or with engineers or with technologists, but um, designing the actual environments through which this can be activated. Which is also through a series of questions. It's knowing which, what are the right questions to ask, I guess. Absolutely, and, um, and, and knowing also that the, the questions that you ask this year are not necessarily the ones 
that matter the following year. That's kind of the evolution. So um, the residency came about because I was the guinea pig. Um, I went to Boston and I spent five months, um, you know, working on a project I had been devising through um, a Jaspis residency in Stockholm. And I knew I could build it at, at Ginkgo. I knew what tools I needed. Um, I had been collaborating with scientists, still very difficult uh, once you arrive in, in, in that setting. Um, but but I, I had a hypothesis and I sort of executed it. But while I was doing that, I was trying to configure how you could actually institute what I was doing um, in, in a way that would a facilitate others to come after, um, but that the learning that I was doing was reciprocate, reciprocal with um, the support I was given um, uh, by Ginkgo and by occupying that space, but that my learning became everybody else's learning. So structurally, how do you make that happen? Um, and, and it's really simple things like, um, where, does the resident, where is the resident allowed to go in the building and not allowed to go? And what does it mean that they're not allowed to go in, into this particular space? Well, at Ginkgo, the resident can pretty much go anywhere. Um, uh, how do we uh, compensate the resident in a way that starts to attribute value to their knowledge system um, and that that value is something that everyone in the organization can bear witness to that was also very important so there are these sort of small institutional things that you start to think to build into the thing to create the platform for um for for some equalizing factors to emerge between disciplines it's very interesting because it, this reflects in a different way a conversation I had with Bruce Mao, the Canadian designer, recently. Where he, he was talking about the need to be a whole brain creative, but at the same time, uh, the respect for depth and expertise. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. In other words, it's, it's knowing how to fuse and how to work and how to harness uh, people's expertise, uh, but in an open framework or structure, um, rather than and somebody purporting to be the master of everything or people becoming so siloed that they never speak together um do you, do you which, which obviously chimes with what you're saying um, i'm I, i'm curious about your method though because i love this idea of of letting material exploration uh, take its course when you discovered the um, streptomyces coelicola if i pronounced it right was that a kind of almost damascene moment did you suddenly see this pigment i think crikey that's got potential or was that still the result of a long slow process of material research um that's such a good question and i might link it back to this transition that i had to make between architecture and um textile futures i remember with our first brief um actually you know it was at interview stage um caroline till said to me you know we want people who can make more than renders <laughs> and i thought i don't quite know how to make renders anyway, because I think I just, I left just at the cusp of learning how to uh, use uh, that kind of software infrastructure. Um, and, uh, but, I, but what she was saying is, um, you need to make with your hands um, and, and you, you can't come um, with, a, with a brief already when you don't know what the thing is. Um, so what I had to unlearn on material futures was having a design brief from the start. Uh, I, I, I didn't know that I was designing a school. Um, I just had a set of circumstances that I had to make to know. And this was terrifying, um, but that's what the, the course teaches you to do. By the time I uh, started working with John and he said, well, here is an organism. I don't have uh, any scientific knowledge to work with it in, in a way that feels legitimate. So, so how else do I feed around for that? Um, and it turns out that if you feed an organism and you keep it in the conditions it prefers, it will grow, it will flourish. Um, and, and that this particular organism, when it's doing that, is producing pigment. And so the challenge there was, how do I um, cook with this organism? <laughs> uh, and, and, what, and what is it telling me it can do? And I think that textile connection, though it was made early, the real aha moment came about a year later, because unfortunately I did go into that um, initial experimental phase 
feeling like the only thing I could hold on to was a design brief. And so um, the notion of the, uh, the drop-in replacements, this is um, a term that's used in industrial biology to, uh, to describe how you might take streptomyces CD color and just um, grow it in a vat and um, extract the pigment and then you've got pigment powder that you can drop into existing textile systems. That's the mentality that I was taking with me. And of course, what I quickly realized and with um, my lack of uh, process engineering skills to be able to do this, um, is that I was, I was uh, fighting a losing battle trying to extract this pigment. Um, it had no efficacy on the textile system I was trying to integrate it with. But I also realized that it could uh, stop us from actually innovating anything because we would just be dropping it into an existing system. And what I was now learning at that time is that the existing system is actually broken. So the, the, the point at which things changed a year later was when I actually started to grow this organism with the textile. And that was like, boom, suddenly your questions, right? They change. How do you control an organism you can't see? You need tools for that. You need to design those tools as relates to the spatial conditions that you work under, as relates to the materials you might be wanting to die, uh, die with. Uh, I discovered uh, very quickly that um, it, when you uh, ferment this organism with the textile, on the textile, it deploys the pigment onto the fiber without any chemicals. So this is like a holy grail scenario in the textile industry to not need any mordants to fix these um, pigment molecules onto said uh, fiber. And that the water, the amount of water we were using um, was, it, I mean, it, you know, where I get asked by the number, about the numbers a lot and it, uh, it, we have a, a ballpark number of about 500 times less water than ordinarily yeah. found. Um, but then that really depends on the circumstances that you're doing this with. So what I then realized um, a year later is that uh, this was a craft oriented, fermentation based, um, intuitive thing that I was doing and that I just needed to get really good at it. I needed to get good at nurturing that life in this context. Um, and that resulted in about 15 different protocols for dyeing textiles um, with bacteria for a color fast finish. Um, and, and that those protocols could, could then be design led. Because then I was asking questions like, I wonder how I could make a uniform finish. I wonder how I could make um, a finish that, um, that's graphic in, in nature. Again, it's about tools, but it's also about the conditions that you grow the organism in. So that design-led inquiry about how you, you, you ferment bacteria is, is what biodesign is. That's what we didn't realize we were creating at the time, myself and other practitioners working with uh, you know, other organisms. Um, and, and now it's sort of consolidating into this design practice that, that asks, okay, we have mycelium, um, what are the material benefits and performances it can afford us um, within an architectural setting? Um, how do we think about aesthetics? How do we think about the business models uh, to actually scale these um, material systems so that they can be petroleum um, derivative replacements um, or concrete uh, replacements, etc. How far off are we from, from biodesigned materials having a significant impact on, say, the fashion industry? I mean, everything you've just said, they're original, they have a quality that's all their own, they're 500 times, um, they need 500 times less water, so the whole sustainability and inverted commas uh, agenda gets, gets talked to, but they're not widespread. H how far off that are we? Oh, we've got a, we've got a while to go, um, and we have a while to go for all sorts of reasons. Um, we're trying to scale um, these material systems that exist in nature and are governed by um, uh, nature's uh, restrictions. I, I don't want to call them restrictions, they are constraints. Um, and we're trying to extrapolate and make them fit uh, into, a, into a construction that has accommodated the abundance of the oil age. And so the challenge with biodesign is actually less on the technical, there's technical, of course, to be able to efficiently grow these systems so that they can um, do what we're asking them to do. But what has become urgent 
is to determine under which context we actually use them that they have an impact. So we, we cannot reduce um, this field and our expectations about it um, to what is the cost of this pigment per milligram as compares to the oil um, derivative we've been using to dye textiles so far. Then it's just like, don't bother, let's not do that. But when you start to say, how do we get people to consume less? Because we're consuming stuff we don't need uh, and at a scale that's just not sustainable regardless of where it comes from. Um, that's that's the, the socio fix to the, to the technical. And we need to get really good at articulating with each of these interventions where impact can be had, not just because we have a technology that works, but because we are also working on uh, what Drew MD uh, calls the cultural technology. Um, and, and these are the mindset shifts, the organizational shifts, the societal and cultural shifts that need to start to evolve to actually accommodate nature's abundance. And, and that is an economic question. It is a political question. Um, it is a design culture question more generally. Designers are really good at making stuff. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'm really excited that, you know, we have a, a, a new generation of bio designers um, and practitioners outside of that space who are agitating in their own ways, who are saying, we do need a systems change. Um, but it's so important that the, the technological capacity that is being built right now um, actually uh, pushes for um, a, a, a social um, change as well. So when we talk about a project like Project CD Color and, and what that development um, space looks like for what we can do, within five to ten years, I think that um, there will be a clear case that this can scale. Uh, and we see examples of pigment um, biotech companies that are, uh, that are already um, scaling um, this technology. Um, but we also see uh, people like Maurizio uh, over at Mogu Materials, who is um, scaling mycelium for uh, the built environment and determining what scale means in that context too, right? So our ideas of impact, our ideas of scale, they have to be able to shift with the realities that uh, the world that we're trying to move on from yes, was one of abundance, um, but it was, it was, it's also one that's no longer sustainable. Do, does the COVID crisis, I mean, again, it's a reductive idea, but does the COVID crisis facilitate this shift in attitude, do you think? I mean, we know it's complicated. We know that a lot of corporations and, and individuals will, will, will want to go back to the original model to try and save themselves economically. But do you have genuine grounds for optimism that this will help facilitate a sea change in the way that we see our relationship to nature and, and, and the way we see the, the, the future of the planet? I think that um, those institutions, organisations, individuals who are already invested in this will continue to do the work um, and they will continue to invest there. Uh, I, I also think that those who were greenwashing will stop because it's really expensive to greenwash, especially during uh, this time and afterwards. Um, if, if all that was concerning these businesses um, was the bottom line. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that um, this moment, at least for those people who are engaged in the work, um, would have would have just made it really concrete why it matters uh, and why we have to push harder. Um, and that I hope that there are enough people out there who have been genuinely invested uh, in, in decoupling from our dependencies on, on oil uh, for so much of our material existence. Uh, you know, I, I, have, I, I hope that some of those uh, organizations, enterprises, corporations are big enough to, to carry this forward as well. You talk about a new generation of bio designers, which sounds incredibly exciting. Um, intellectually, I was very struck by the fact you said that you know, look, reading architecture in your cultural shift from Zimbabwe to, to the UK, and you find that the intellectual limitations of it all. Um, but do you think, in it, both intellectually as well as culturally, there is an, an increasing diversity in bio design, the people who are doing it and the attitudes, or are we still fundamentally stuck in, in structures that have existed in the broad profession of design and architecture that have existed for, for the decades? Um, hmm, how do I answer that question without being facetious? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
feel free to be facetious. It, it may, may speak volumes. No, I, I, I think that there's so much work to do um, to decolonize um, the academy that it's, I can't possibly say that we're at a point right now where we have really brilliant examples of a, 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 a diverse enough pool of people working in, in this space. Um, I'm one of the only black people in the biodesign field. And, and I would argue that I'm the only one I know, and that's very telling. Mm. Um, I, I, I've seen a couple of people at conferences and we've never connected yet, but you know, it, it's very white. Um, as it is called biodesign. And I think that's really important to acknowledge here that what is being called biodesign, when you get to um, the heart of it, is the modernization, if you like, of um, ongoing reciprocal um, engagements between human and non-human that indigenous peoples all over the world have been practicing. What's different is that we understand nature uh, in a way that um, we've never understood nature because of the tools and the technologies we have to read and write DNA. Um, and, and we can have conversations about how do we scale um, the fermentation of this yeast to produce uh, a new fiber because of that. And so what we're calling biodesign in, in, in some regards, um, there are many it is, it is very uh, diverse who is doing that work if you take the term away. Um, but then I think that in its formalized version, um, the kinds of people who are coming to it and the institutions that they come from, the lens of education that they've had, um, it, it's, it's all the same. So I've been very uh, deliberate with my team, at least, to start to look for at least expertise that is outside of biodesign to be able to reconfigure what this could be. And I think that's been incredibly rewarding. So we have art direction, we have um, expertise rather in art direction, in, um, in architecture, in production, um, in strategic design management, because I'm not sure that we're just asking the material question. We're also asking the systemic question. And if your systemic question uh, involves and includes questions of equity, um, this notion of better, uh, that you know these technologies are going to save us. Save who? Um, how do you make them save us? Who is us? Um, those structural inequities that we see all across our society, they are baked in. So the work that exists is to and I feel very passionate about this at, at the beginning, if you like, you know, I've been in biodesign now for 10 years, but it, it still feels like the beginning. To just articulate that we cannot um, just be really, really complacent at the wonders of nature and what nature can do for us. Um, we have to start seeing this in, in terms of uh, recipro reciprocity, we have to start seeing it in terms of human to human relations. How have we treated each other prior to this? How would we like to treat, treat each other prior to this? Because the benefits for these technologies, the benefits for these new systems are abundant, um, but they won't be if we have built uh, structural hurdles to making it thus. So design may be the solution, but design and the structures of its uh, current um, educational system and opportunity has got a lot to learn. And that's Akiesa, thanks so much. It was great to speak to you. Thank you, Tim.